Do you remember that episode of Spongebob where Squidward has made a wax figure of himself and he's gone upstairs to take a bath when Spongebob and Patrick are about to come over and ask to play and they destroy his statue. He hears the ruckus, he comes downstairs and he says, look what you've done to me. And this misunderstanding that the artwork is him causes Spongebob and Patrick to think that they've murdered him. Which completely changes the fabric of their relationship for this episode and has absolutely nothing to do with what we'll be talking about for the rest of the video. So, Stop You Buddy Coon sure is an, an anime. Um, I was seven minutes into the first episode when I decided I felt some kind of way about it. And I had actually not watched past that seventh minute when I put in the last video that I had opinions on he buddy which if nobody watched that video, I mean I know literally nobody didn't because like a few people watched it, but like it, I was like going for an experimental moment, now I've got a camera that can do audio and I wanted to just do this kind of thing in the first place and not do a mic only. So here we are, even though I do miss my other mic and how high quality the audio was. It's fine. So, about he buddy Coon, the reason why in the seventh minute I was shaken to my core is because um, he buddy's dad, like the first minute that they're on screen together, which is that seventh minute, he buddy's dad is like, why are you being a pervert and a flirt and making eyes and like, essentially, like, why are you being a slut? And it's just like, oh, okay, so this is the tone of our 80s story. This is not exactly, um, John Hughes, is that his name? I don't know, I'm not, I'm only old to young people. <laughs> I don't even know, that might be a self-read, actually, I don't know. Can you tell I finished off a bottle? Well, can't be doing grand endorsements, but, um, I am inebriated. Know that. So, I go back to you, buddy. I start watching and I'm thinking, okay, what do I want to say about this? Because clearly I've got to say something. And first I'm thinking, like, Raylan Connell emphasized femininity. Is he body, like, reifying femin- or is he body supporting patriarchy? Is he body self-actualizing? Like, what's the story there? So to get to the bottom of that, I picked apart, encoded, trans- there's like an- there's an academic word for it and I can't remember what it is. But when you go through a, a text, like a um, piece of media or, yeah, a text, and mark all of the times, whether it's words, paragraphs, scenes, seconds, whatever, that a character, a concept is present, that's sort of the basis for like your communications analysis, if you will. And um, I found that in the three episodes and in the OP, um, he body was generally like working to fulfill a personal goal or wish rather than just passively existing as ornamentation for patriarchy. And I know I've, there's like one gender studies grad student in the audience who's like raising their finger and it's like, yes, you're right. It's infinitely more complicated than that, but I don't want people who this is all new to, to click off this video. So I'm hoping we're doing okay. But yeah, Raymond Connell basically just talked about how like femininity kind of exists in the context of masculine power in pretty much every culture on earth. So a feminine person has to choose, like, do I support masculinity? Do I rebel against it? Do I try to be indifferent? Do I mix together strategies? Um, and I would say that he body is definitely like a sort of is fortunate to transcend the gender binary in a way. Um, and as I was thinking about that, that made me have to like take it a little bit further because like, okay, well, like we're saying, I mean, I do think it's significant to say things about the first three episodes of a Shonen Jump anime or the first three chapters of a Shonen Jump manga because a serialized, highly um, produced publisher like that is putting a lot of stock into the first three chapters. Like, if you don't have the readership by the third chapter, it's it's not a done, you know, like, things, things happen. I am not the manga expert here, but, like, that's a very known thing, at least in, now, in this... Western critic community. And um, 
I don't know, so I started thinking, well, like, what's a bit more, because in the second episode, it's really clear that they're telling like, a story about gender, maybe not a trans story, maybe not a queer story, but when all the hater girls are ugly and all the not hater girls are pretty, it's like, okay, okay. So, um, the feminists to whom I resorted for counsel on this question was none other than Miss Gloria Steinem herself, darling. And, um, she, she was asking the big questions back in 83, let me tell ya, um, which is when this anime started, I think, and she wrote this essay before 83, but Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellions was published in 83. All of her good stuff is in this. I hope I'm pointing to it. Um, the... Um, basically, she's just like, we shouldn't, you know, so what if you're a man living in a woman's body? And it's like, well, um, that's all well and good, but, like, people do want to integrate into society, and for a lot of people, that means a, a physical transition, not to mention that often any physical danger or discomfort or whatever, um, posed by surgery is in many cases just not equivalent to the, um, the psychological anguish of, of living as a trans person who is not able to seek whatever adequate care is in their life. And um, that's why I really don't like, and again, I, th I do not think Gloria Steinem is a transphobe, but she's been doing the work for like pretty much every group of people as long as she's been doing journalism. Um, but I just, uh, it's fortunate that we can look back now and look, sorry if I just spit on you. <laughs> it's fortunate that we can look back now and be like, oh, Glory, this, this was not it. Because like, we're not talking about shoes. We're talking about um, living bodies, like inextricable from the humans who possess them. So in that case, it, 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 like, it is that deep. Some people do really need surgery, some people don't, whatever. But she's not saying that, like, oh, well, trans people shouldn't get surgery. Like, I, I, it's hardly that. I think it's just, like, um, because it, the article is really good, actually, how she talks about how, like, um, and she uses transsexual instead of transgender. It's, like, the 70s or whatever. Cut, this is just some slap. But she talks about how, like, the... Uh, uh, trans women are often just used as like placeholders and fodder for arguments and rhetoric in like gender spaces to be like, oh, well, you know, being a woman's so easy, even a man can do it. And it's so fucked up that she made that observation in 1970 and it's like in many ways still where we are today. But, you know, She's not a, I mean, she's, she's, she's a journalist, you know, she's not, she would have wanted to get up in the, the Toei or the Shonen Jump offices. She wouldn't give a shit about actually reading the book that much. So, in think, thinking of media people, I'm drawn to Horkheimer and Adorno, who have this notion of the culture industry. And it's like, oh, anyway, um, so when we think of, like, Horkheimer and Adorno's notion of the culture industry, we're thinking of this thing that is producing and reproducing the dominant hegemonic values of culture. Shonen Jump is the culture industry. So I, I think like there's a way out of this where it's like, you know, um, it doesn't matter if Hibari is supporting the patriarchy, it doesn't matter so much if Hibari, the character, is happy rather that we've got this trans story of a trans character who is in Shonen Jump, and that's that, that's that's subversive, right? There's an argument for that there, right? And there is, in my opinion, it is a bad argument. So the thinker that I'm actually drawn to in consideration for this video is none other than Audre Lorde herself, and specifically her 1979 lecture at the Second Sex Conference, The Master's Tools Will Not Dismantle the Master's Half of Certain, which is not or never, I don't know. And so first of all, in general, I think like on a YouTube level, the most poignant element of that, le or of that speech is the line, it is a particular academic ignorance 
to assume any discussion of feminist thought without specific consideration for our many differences, especially those of black women, poor and third world women, and lesbians. Like, quite a few people um, could benefit from you know, men, women of all colors, sexualities, genders, and such. Like, some something to really think about. And um, when we do that, when we do what Audre Lorde asks us to do at the Second Sex Conference, which I, I'll probably, yeah, I don't know, I don't have energy for that right now. But when, when, when we look a bit further, when we don't just say, oh, well, the body, the, the, the person, he body, he body, he body. Who is Ozora Hibari? Where does she live, go to school, everything such as that? She's the heir to a Yakuza. And by technicality, she, she is the heir, even though she's third born. And like, for all intents and purposes, is, there's like no heir. Well, I have Kosaku's probably the heir now, I guess, I don't know. Um, because, you know, Peabody eventually is like accepted pretty much. And, um, yay. <laughs> It's sort of, it's one of those things where it's like, it's great when a trans, and, and yes, this is in the 80s, but like, we haven't even gotten into the transness of it all. Um, rich people who are blonde haired and blue eyed and charismatic and the smartest person in school and the best athlete that all of the boys love usually do well. <laughs> they usually do succeed. Um, and that is... There's just like a, there's certain groups of people who enjoy immense amounts of privilege. So to say that because he body, because it like not, I understand being like he body's trans, because I feel like he body's obviously trans, like she's going to school as a girl and everything. But like you're literally watching a rich girl live stealth. And it's a fun fantasy, but when one bandies about this idea that he body, that Stop Peabody Coon is a trans anime, not only are you painting this like very, very Eurocentric, like capitalist Malibu Dreamhouse fantasy of girliness and womanhood, but you're also saying that the trans anime is an anime that in the third episode, a black character is paid to assault Peabody on multiple categorical levels he is called a demon by the main character, compared to a demon by the main character, excuse me, because it's completely fucking different, and beaten up by Peabody for a gab, and it's funny, and it's, 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 it's all for a laugh. And that, I don't think I actually published the video where I talked about how the majority of, it was just a little blip, but for like a 30 seconds or so I talked about how dark skin characters are always, it's, if, if you see a dark-skinned human character in an anime, you're usually looking at a tan character, unfortunately. You're usually looking at a character that has tan lines, and not a character that was, like, born with pigment in their skin. And if you are looking at a character that was born with pigment in their skin, they're usually a demon king, a dark elf, um... In indigenous... exile tribe, you know, it's like never... And even indigenous exile tribe, I'm pretty sure that's just Full Metal Alchemist. I, I think, because that's still humanizing, that's like you're a person like me, I'm pretty sure, I might be forgetting that show. Um, oh, sweet Jesus. So yeah, yeah, when you attempt to apply any sincere intellectual rigor to the marginalized storytelling of Peabody Coon, I think it leaves one wanting. And if you feel differently, that is totally okay. If you personally are like, I love the shit out of this story, this helped me so much when I was a kid or when I was coming out or what, I in no way wish to take that from you. I in no way wish to inspire in straight or cis viewers the uh, wish to criticize trans people for, oh, fucking, you cry about representation and blah, 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 and you're just, uh, <sighs> No, no, we're liter we're doing gender studies class right here, okay? And that's like, but if you don't like the way I'm doing this, that's fine. You can go. I'm, you know, I'm not doing this for fucking money. I'm doing this because I don't feel like people talk about this series super sensibly. 
And, um, yeah, what is, you know, the, the, like, what are black, indigenous, and of color trans youth to think when they're getting into anime and people are telling them, oh, watch you, buddy, it's on the internet archive, and they get to the third episode and they don't even get to see a character and be like, oh, like, that character it represents me. Like, I can feel connected to that character and then have something messy happen. The first character that they can really identify with is, like, scary. And then also the tan, the, like, Yakuza guard guys are tan and they're, like, ugly. Uh, so there's just so many different levels on why this just is... It, it, it's not... This is an anime problem. This is a manga problem. This is not specific to Hibari. It's not indicative. I think I, I don't think it means Hisashi Eguchi is like this vile racist or anything. I'm also white. It really doesn't matter what I mean. People who are like, oh, well, it's not that serious. Like, it's not a racist thing, whatever. And then some level, like, that's probably true if you really want to be nitpicky and be like, oh, well, a Japanese blah, blah, blah. But it's like, I don't fuck with moral relativism. I don't fuck with this idea of like, oh, well, people from all over the world, but nah, 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 we all grow up watching fucking pale ass people on our TV screens and their mamas and daddies. And um, yeah. And the worst part is, the worst part is, is that this is not even the most pressing matter regarding anybody good. <sighs>
Yeah, but um, remember how I said that SpongeBob had nothing to do with this? I was lying. What happens when we over-identify with concepts, frankly? I wanted to say works, but I mean, some people are doing it to an extent with Eguchi, which I'm over-identify to an extent. I'm getting a little vague. But when you, when you really hold on to an idea, when you say, the statue is me, or like for a different example, Bell Hooks. I think it was her new school interview with her dialogue with Gloria Steinem. It might have been the one with Beverly Guy Sheffield. But she's talking about being at the dentist's office and she sees this girl coloring um, a Doc McSuffin's coloring page. And she's coloring Doc, like, pale. Like, probably somewhere on my skin, I don't know. Doc McSuffin, not pale. And, um,. Belle's like, hey, what are you doing? Like, why are you coloring Doc that way? And she's like, oh, well, I don't want my Doc to be brown. Brown's dirty. And Belle Hooks talks about how, um, you know, the, the child sees brown Doc through the screen. But when Doc comes into the home and into the life as an object to play, Doc must be like the child. And it's a very big leap to say that this is like the same as saying Eguchi is trans or like thrusting a super progressive trans narrative onto anybody. It's really not. To say that would be to oversimplify like both colorism and racism and all kinds of things. But like there's colorism and racism present in anybody. So I don't, <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Don't fucking be Squidwardian. Don't say that whether someone else made it, whether you made it, what, whether it's a person, don't say this thing is me and I am willing to shift my perception of myself or others or allow others' perception of me to be shifted in service of this thing. Like, that's what you do for, like, an ideal or, like, I mean, a, maybe a person that you know and love and, like, is willing to also do that kind of thing for you, sure, but a person that you only know through through screens and such that you have no meaningful interaction. And I mean, even meaningful interaction. Fuck, you know? You start an online queer co-op. I don't care, but at least have each other on Discord. At least, like, know it's somebody who will check in on you if you don't message them in a few days because they're making sure you're okay. Like, I don't, I'm not giving you crazy rules to live by here. So, oh my god, I think I've blabbered on for long enough. Thanks very much for hanging out with me. I'm so surprised my hair hasn't fallen down. I don't, yeah, I don't have a thing in. Um, but, um, thank you so much. I hope you have wonderful weather today and tomorrow, wherever you are. And, yeah, um, just keep waiting for the day that I eventually make that video about how Bleach is, uh, way better than War and Peace and Anna Karenina.